was an exercise. Um, sigma 1 plus sigma n plus squared is 5. So sigma i, sigma j is equal to sigma j, sigma i. for i, j, 1 and minus 1, if i minus j, they differ by 2. So this is called distant indices. Now the other one that I wanted you to look at. So sigma 2, sigma 3, sigma 2. So sigma 2. Sigma 3. Sigma 2. What did I do? Something is odd. Dun dun dun. No, it's okay. Sigma three, sigma two, sigma three. Uh, Sigma three What about those? Same, not same. I couldn't hear. You want to count what? want to look at it like this crossing is the same as this one. Yeah, that is true. But what does it tell me? Are you sure? one is two. Let's lift it up. This one. Okay, I'm really not sure I managed, but I'll try. So this one, this one, this one, then this one. Right? Am I good? I'm good. So, and the other one. Uh, I have to do this and this. So, if I had an assistant who would just keep the strand downstairs at the endpoints, you would see that I could move from one to the other just by, I think, moving a bit the green one in between the blue and the purple. So I can have a continuous map from one to the other, a continuous family of braids, which means that there is a topic. If I wanted to see the inverse, I would invert the crossing, so I don't think I would see them on the same place. No. So again, isotopic. 
Do you think it's just about two and three? Of course not. It's the same for each consecutive indices. So the other relation that I have is that sigma i, wait, well, sigma i plus one, sigma i is sigma i plus one, sigma i, sigma i plus one, for i between one and minus two. So, and these two are called the braid relations. And, um, any other relations that you will have will, you can have it as a consequence of those. Uh, by the way, uh, if you look at the move that I have to do, so taking this one a bit up and moving the one beneath, this is called sometimes <laughs> a Reidemeister tree move in knot theory. Um, not sure I will talk again about this, but if someone have look has looked at not theory one day, probably have seen. So, now the other way around. What if I have a group with generators, sigma 1, sigma n, well, n generators, and these relations, what can I say about it? Well, it is my braid group. Like these generators with these relations completely characterize the braid group. And you can forget where they where these relations are coming from and just take this as an abstract definition of the braid group. And to make sense of that, I have to tell you a bit about group generated by um, group defined by generators and relations. Maybe you've seen it, depending on where you were before. Some of you have not, if you were here around. So that's the next. Uh, next topic. So this I keep. So, algebraic definition. So, this way to define it, sometimes it's called the Artin braid group. He gave this presentation, as we say. So, definition. The Artin braid group. Bn. So I draw the B of B4 curly and this one uh, straight, and then we'll prove that they're the same. So is the group generated by? Oh no. You didn't ask. I made a mistake. Y 
Yes, that's the one. So I have n strands, right? So the last one starts at n minus 1, so it's sigma n minus 1. Please change this in your notes. So, and these are living in the n. Okay, and if I have done this elsewhere, please change it as well. I was careful in the indices afterwards, but not there. <laughs> so, so generated by n minus one generators. So we call them sigma one, sigma n minus one, and the relations. So the break group relations. So I will just copy. the thing I had above, so sigma i, sigma j, sigma j, sigma i, if i and j are distant, and from 1 to n minus 2, sigma i, sigma i plus 1, sigma i is sigma i plus 1, sigma i, sigma i plus 1. And the notation for that is the n, the generators, the relations. So I will just write them. Oh, yeah, maybe I will write them properly. So I'm writing what is equal to one. So with the condition. Sigma i plus one minus one, sigma i minus one, sigma i plus one minus one. And I should add the, the indices, but I want to spare some blackboard. <laughs> so for this to be a definition, I must justify to you what it means to be a group generated by generators and relations. So a bit of this. If you haven't seen it. And if you did, you can help me. <laughs> so, in practice, having generators for a group, you know what that is. So, it means that each element of your group can be written as a word in these generators or the inverse. So, if your generators, how do I want to call that? Yeah, I want a set of generators. In the general case, first, so I will call my group G, my generators S1, S, M, and then we'll see what it means for the break group. So any element of G, I can write it as S, I1, some exponent i a1 s i2 i a2 s i k uh, a k i want my s uh, my uh, k to be an integer i want my a i j to be in that stuff 
so for the break group, we saw that these sigma i plus were generators, for instance. Um, and now for a general group, you might have identities between these generators, which will be called relations. So how to define formally uh, a group by generators and relation? It will be a quotient. So and a quotient of first a group that has no relations, namely a free group. So remember, the free group generated by, um, maybe I should call this S, by S. So it is the set of such elements. So I want k in n, so my s i's are in s, I want s i j different than s i j plus 1 when I write them like that, so I want two consecutive one to be distinct. And a i j in z star. So this would describe for me this free group generated by elements of S. So how is it a group? Well, if I have one element written like that and another one written like that with primes, say, um, then I just put the words next to each other. I concatenate the words. And this defines for me a group. No problem there. You can just define it, check that it's associative, etc., etc. You have inverse by taking minus the exponents and reversing the order. All good. So this would be the free group generated by an element S. Uh, and the unit element corresponds to any um, k equals zero in this writing. Um, so, let's see. Uh, this is three. Two should be up. And one should be down. So, let's do an example. What if my set of generators is just one element. So if it's just one element, what should be fs? Can you recognize it? So, example, s equal just one element. So, fs is just the s to the a for a in z minus 0, and there is also 1, which I can write like that. Or I could, if I would allow a to be 0, and if I take the product of s a and s b, it's just a plus b, if I take the inverse, so do you recognize who that is? Mm. 
But there won't be because I'm not putting any condition on S. It's just an abstract. It's just that. And the, the map is just to this element you associate the exponent. Indeed, when we'll have relations, then this may happen. So it's just an abstract set, S. And then you're building a group out of this by writing words in this element and inverse of it. So, yeah, is it clear for everybody that this gives me an isomorphism with that? Yeah. Okay, so easy one that we already know. Um, did I want another one? Mm. Let's just meditate on the the set with two elements. So then I want to write words in S and T and S minus ones, T minus ones, of course. Is it so for one element, I had z. Is this isomorphic to z times z? Because I have two elements. What do you think? No? Why not? So here, I have an abelian group. But here, I never said, so we don't have. that st is equal to ts. So no. So this is just a free group on two generators. It exists like that. Um, so we are interested in relations. Like your colleague said that if we have s to the a, which is a again equal to s then we would have not the isomorphic with z but with something else here if we have the condition that the, the two commutes then we'll have another group not this one so we want to work with relations so dealing with relations so relations will be so I will denote them by R, a set of words in elements of S. Because it's there are words in elements of S, in particular, they live inside Fs. What can you do? Um, and now I want to look at an index R. So the smallest normal subgroup of Fs containing the set R. Normal subgroup, everybody remembers? Yes. So what does, what's the condition? So for all elements of your group, you want a G, R, uh, an R, sorry. G minus one belong to? Did I write something? Oh, sorry. Thank you. So, 
what do we do with normal subgroups? We take quotients. Uh, this one. So we will take the quotient of this free group Fs by its normal subgroup, and this will be the group we want to define. So now consider the quotient. So Fs by Nr, it's a group. You know that from your algebra course. And this is the one that I denote by the set of generator and the set of relations. So it's the <laughs> group defined by the generators S and the relations R. So let's get back to our examples. So S was one element and now I want a relation to be a word in S. Um, someone give me an integer. You were suggesting that. One? Uh, yeah, not the integer one. Two. Okay. Do you want two? Nine. Two is good. So. Who is SR? I think I've heard it. It's Z mod 2. So it's generated by S, but in this group, S2 must be 1. What can we do? So, and the identification, we say, say it's sent to the class of 1. Of course, it works with other numbers just the same, S3, S4. Um, let's get back to our free group on two generators and the relation of commutation. So that was one. Two generators. And my commutation relations as t equal t s, so s minus 1, t minus 1. So I want the group generated by that, such that this is becoming 1. In other words, such that s t is equal to t s. And so f s mod n r denoted as R here, is isomorphic to Z times Z this time. Is it? Okay. And so now, this art in braid group that I just defined for you, you now know what it should be. You have your set of generators, sigma 1 till sigma n minus 1. And your set of relations, as I wrote them here, sigma i, sigma j, sigma i minus 1, sigma j minus 1, for a minus j bigger than 2. And for the consecutive ones, 
sigma i sigma i plus 1, sigma i sigma i plus 1 minus 1, sigma i minus 1, sigma i plus 1 minus 1. You can add your the where the indices are living. And this gives me the n. So now it's a group that is well defined algebraically. We've forgotten where we got this break group relation, so it lives just for itself in algebra. But we would like to relate this to the group we had before. Um, so you have in this context of group with relations and quotient, this working lemma that I'm going to write. Uh, no. Yes. Your up. Your. So. Where did I put my working lemma? Working lemma. So if I have a group, um, so if G1, Gn minus 1 are elements of a group G satisfying the braid group relations. Then there is a unique there is a unique group homomorphism F from the Artin braid group into G such that uh, the GIs are the images of the sigma I and this from 1 to n minus 1. Why is this true? This is an exercise you could have done just with the definition of a quotient group. How do I define f? So remember bn? is this fs mod nr with the s and r that I wrote for you above. How can I define f? So it's a quotient group. I don't know how to deal with the quotient. I have to start with the group I'm quotienting from because I don't like to work with representative. So I will define another map from fs to g first. What's your guess? How can I define it? So yeah, fs is completely defined by its generators. So any map homomorphism group will be completely determined by the images of the generators. So you can define it by just prescribing that your generators are sent to this element GI. And now to see that this map induces something on the quotient, what do you have to check? Yes? 
So subjectivity, maybe not necessarily. I'm not saying anything about the lemma. Say it again. So you want all the people who are living in an R to be sent to one. And an R is defined as the normal subgroup, the smallest one containing R. So you just have to check that for all the elements, so check that all R is in an R. So for all of them, f bar of r is sent to 1. And for this, you just need to check uh, the, the elements of r. So what are they? So you need to check first that sigma i, sigma j, sigma i minus 1, sigma j minus 1 is sent by f bar to 1. Remember that f bar is the group morphism defined by this identity on the generators. So as a group morphism, this is equal to f bar of sigma i, f bar of sigma j, f bar of sigma i minus 1, f bar of sigma j minus 1. If I write what f bar of sigma i is, it's just g i, g j, g i minus 1, g j minus 1. But I said that those elements satisfy the braid group. So this is equal to 1, the braid group relation. OK? Convinced? So it's the same thing with the other braid group relation. I guess you can do it by yourself. And so. This f bar indeed induce a map, a group homomorphism from f s mod n r into g, and this guy is nothing but our group b n. Now, if I apply this working lemma to my braid group that I define with the geometrical braids. What can I do? I can take for the element g1, gn minus 1, my sigma i plus, for instance. I could take my sigma i minus if I prefer. We check that they satisfy the braid group relation. So we have at least a map going to from the end to g. So let me write this. It's two. No, this is not two. Two should go up. should go down. So, yes, for g is equal to bn of our section 1 from this morning. Uh, for s, uh, for gi is equal sigma i plus, we get the Morphism, the group morphism, uh, Bn 
uh, not G anymore, curly BM. It is injective because I'm quotienting exactly by uh, by the normal subgroup, MR. Although I haven't told you whether it should be subjective, but we have that the BNs are generated by the sigma I plus. So in this case, we have also subjectivity because sigma I plus generates. So they are the same. So if you didn't like what we did this morning, now you can forget and just work with the algebra version. This is a fantastic group. There is something for every taste. So maybe this is the right time to wonder what are the small BMs. So What is B1? Uh, because we quotient exactly by an R, so it was already injective before. Wasn't it? Let me see. Am I saying something? I think I'm being too quick. <laughs> so. So the kernel should be, no, I haven't proved to you that it's the kernel. I only proved that it's subjective. Oh, what am I missing? Okay, subjectivity, I think we're good. Injectivity, am I missing something? So we have the quotient. There might be more. I haven't proved for you that there were not any other ones. This is weird. Should be straightforward. Okay. Another question for you two that I will think about when I'm not tired. So, to be explained, I can't think at the board. So, I will not figure out, even if it's obvious for me. It won't be now. <laughs> Yeah. There it is. Yeah, well. Let's continue and maybe I'll figure this out. What is B1? So if I write it with generators and relations, n minus 1, so empty set, empty set. just the trivial group. What is B2? So B2, I have sigma 1, relations, no relations, so it's the free group on one generator, so it's set. And I had the question before this morning, so if you believe that what I haven't proved for you
namely the isomorphism. So B2, I take two strands. So I have the zero element. I twist one. I twist two. I twist three. It's just the number of twists. And I cannot untwist because untwisting would mean that I have an isotopy between this and this one. But you see, to untwist, I need to change the endpoints downstairs and I need to keep them. So all those elements are not isotopic. And so I can twist the other way around and have my minus numbers. So you could see Z already on your strands. And I could have said this this morning as well. So Z. Let's meditate a bit on B3. So I have sigma 1, sigma 2. I don't have the commutativity relation. I have just this one. 2 minus 1, sigma 1 minus 1, sigma 2 minus 1. Um, so, well, my sigma 1 just have an infinite order just like above. So it's an infinite group. What else can I say? So infinite. Um, it's not abelian, while well this one was. And an elegant way to see it is to recover the projection to the symmetric group. So, three mark. Uh, where do I have this? So I can define a map Bn into the symmetric group on n element. Uh, how? I can send a generator to a transposition. Yes. So I, I plus one, n. So I'm taking the transpositions of two consecutive uh, numbers. And if you look at those, they satisfy the braid group relation. You can check as an exercise. So, um, I should have written like Fs sent to sigma and then is a well, give me a well-defined group morphism from the end to sigma n. That should have been. So, I take the free group generated by n minus 1 elements. I can send it to uh, sigma n by sending this generator to the transposition of consecutive integers. This defines me on the quotient, a map from the n to sigma n from the working lemma. Now you have another argument coming from the symmetric group that they generate the symmetric group. So again, uh, you have something that is a projection. And if you look at the case of B3, you then have a projection on and this S3 is not abelian. C 
so this one cannot be a BV. And that's true for any n bigger than 3. So exercise bn not abelian for n bigger than 3. But I let you think about this. Um, okay. Do I have, I think I'm kind of done with the algebra part for now. Yes. This I want to say later. Other questions about this? Has someone figured out uh, why it was injective in the meantime? No? So let's get back to a bit of topology, but more algebraic topology. Somehow. With a third definition. Ah, no. Yeah, but I need to use that on G, right? On the, on the target. Yes, and somehow I didn't prove to you that the braid group relations were the only one for the braid group defined with the geometric braid. I never said that, and this is what I should say. And somehow, it shouldn't be too complicated, but yeah, not on the top of my mind right now. So, I'll try to fix all that. If, yeah. In the worst case scenario, maybe I'll write notes on my website. So if I don't have it for tomorrow. So where am I on the blackboard? This is one, this is two, this is three. No, this one I want down. Yay. All right. New definition. Maybe it's the right time also to say that there are plenty of things I won't tell you. For instance, all the things rela related to representations. And for algebra people, maybe it's enough to know the, al the algebraic definition for most of the things. So you can start doing representation theory with this Bray group with the algebraic definition and forgetting about the topology that was behind. Two, two, well two. But now I want to speak about configuration spaces. Question? Okay, so there will be again pictures a bit, but maybe there will be more lazy proofs, even more than before. Configuration spaces. So um, will be the space will be only R2 for us. And I will look at, so I'm picking n distinct points, s distinct points, x1, oh no, I said z, z decrease, zn in R2. So I am in R2. 
and I'm picking endpoints here. So the end, end tuple so the, the vector if you want with this z1 zn um, is a configuration point in the configuration space Fn. So it's the collection of these Z1 ZNs with Zi in R2 and Zi is not ZJ if I is not J. So in the configuration space of ordered n tuples. So your space is a set of points, and your points is a collection, an ordered collection of points in R2. So your set is a set of points. Your points are themselves points ordered. It's a bit weird for the first time. Then you get used to it. So like this is a subset of R2n. So R2n is a topological space seen this in topology courses. You might want to see it as a metric space, whatever the topology you want on this. So Fn uh, inherits the, well, whatever the topology, the standard one, but whatever the definition of it you want. Topology of R2. So it's a topological space. Okay. Um, another remark is that because, but it should be proven, because R2 is connected and connected by path, Fn is connected by path. So between two points in R2, you can draw a path. Well, if you take a collection of n points in Fn and another collection of n points in Fn, you can relate them by a points of collections of point in Fn. It's not that obvious that just being connected just gives you that but I don't want to make a topology course now, so you'll have to accept a few of these statements. Um, so, and now I will want to consider something called the fundamental group of this. So maybe you've seen this because, I don't know, you had a mini course somewhere else about that. So this would be a course by itself. So I'm just giving you some recipe and some ideas about it. Maybe one day you will see it again and you will remember stuff that I said. But yeah, just stay calm. We'll figure out something. So want to look at the fundamental group of Fn. So now I will make a parenthesis about what this is for a connected topological space and then we'll apply to this. So 
I will be miserable again. No. Let me start here. So, um, fundamental groups. So, I will give myself x a topological space and I will fix x0 a point in x. And what do I do? I look at loops in this x based at this point. So my x is the world R3 and I fix my point x0 and I will look at loops passing through x0 very well if my space is the sphere I pick a point, x0, and loops, I can take some big circle. I can take just a curve, another topological space that we like is the torus, you know, the surface of the donut. I pick a point. I look at the loops, maybe this one, mm. maybe that one, or maybe that one, all of them. And, well, it won't be a surprise from this morning, we'll want to look at them up to deformation. And we'll make a group out of them. So it sounds very familiar from what we said this morning. So you see, if I'm trying to deform loops in R3, I can always deform them to be just um, crunched to the base point x0. I can do the same with S2. But with the torus, I can't just crush them all into the base point. So it captures the fact that T2 has a hole, for instance, and not the other ones. So it captures something about the topology of your space. Um. So formally a loop in x based at x0 is a continuous path um, in x that starts at ends at x0, so with at points at x0. So gamma from 0, 1 to x, and you want gamma of 0. So this is continuous. Gamma of 0 is equal to gamma of 1. And now we want to be allowed to deform them. So we want to see that two loops are the same up to deformation. 
So here, what we need, so deform that. Continuously. So here, the notion is the notion of homotopy. So a map big H for homotopy from 0, 1 to 0, 1 into x is a homotopy of a loop gamma to a loop gamma prime if it is a continuous map it's such that so my variables from B my parameters T here, S here for some reason. So for all S in 0, 1, so I should do a picture. So this is my square, which is the source space. Um, S is here, T is here. And this is in X. And I have two loops that I want to deform one into the other. So like zero. This is gamma, say. This is gamma prime. So, and what I will parameter is a continuous family of loops from one to the other. So my gammas are parameterized by T, and my family parameterized by S, which was also the parameter this morning, S. And so here, I want to start at gamma. So for S equals 0, I want this to be sent to my loop gamma. I want the endpoint so of my family, so for s equal 1, to parameterize my gamma prime. And in between, I want something here to parameterize for me a loop in between in this family. And so here on the boundary, I'm at x0 here, x0 there. And during the full deformation of the family, I want to stay at this base point. So I want to stay at x0 along all these points. And this is what I'm going to write now. So for the homotopy for t equals 0, I'm at x0. And for t equal 1, I'm also at x0. So I'm writing that I'm sent to x0 here. And for all t in 0, 1, I want that for s equal 0, I'm going along gamma. And for, t for s equal 1, I'm traveling along gamma prime. So the claim is that just as this morning we had an equivalence relation by isotopy, homotopy, is an equivalence relation.
And the idea to prove that, which I will not do, is similarly the same as what we did for the isotopy. Like, um, if you want to check that it is reflexive, then you just define u h t s to be gamma t all the time. Just like this morning for the isotopy, we had the isotopy to be the braid all the time. If you want to check that it's symmetric, then you just have to reverse the isotopy, the, the time in S. So to go through, instead of S, go through 1 minus S. And the transitivity, again, you may have to go a bit faster. So you will take two homotopies and you will get faster to go through your parameter S half of the time for the first and then half of the time for the second. So it should not be a surprise for you, given what we did this morning, that this could be proved to be an equivalence reaction. It's not more complicated than what we did this morning. I would say it's even easier. Okay? Convinced? Yeah, Rob? I mean, this is also something standard in classes about algebraic topology, so you can see it again. Um, it's also a group. So, Not. So how do I take products of loops? So well, the most natural thing that I can do. So if I have gamma and ga gamma one and gamma two, two loops in X, I create a product. So on my pictures, I have one loop. Gamma one, my other loop, gamma two, so like that. What can I do to create a product? I can just follow gamma one first and then follow gamma two. And then I have a way to, to compose those. Again, if I want to stick to my definition starting with zero one, I have to go through gamma one twice as fast, till one half, and then continue with gamma two. So if you want formulas, uh, gamma one, gamma two is gamma, define as, I go along gamma one of t, of two t, the t between zero and one half, and gamma two t minus one, oops, between one half and one. So very similar to the formulas we had this morning for the product of braids. And same problem as this morning. If you don't work up to deformation, so up to homotopy, you will have problem checking associativity, neutral element, etc., etc. Once you allow yourself to deform your loops, then everything is solved. So the product on loops induces a group structure 
on the quotient, so I didn't give a name yet, loops, modomotopy, which I will call pi1 x x0. So just a sanity check, what do you think is the neutral element? Yes, namely. So just staying at x0 all the time, the constant map to x0 is your neutral element. And if I have a loop, say, this gamma 1, how do I find its inverse? So you want to go? So just taking gamma 1 and going with reverse time. So just uh, so gamma minus gamma 1 gamma 1 inverse of t should be gamma 1 of 1 minus t if you want formulas so you're reversing the time you're going along gamma 1 so well even easier than grade group uh, operations now let's put everything together Or maybe just a remark, because I told you that my configuration space of D4 is path connected. And if X is path connected, then um, it does not matter which base point you choose. So T1 of X at base at X0 is isomorphic to any other one. So that you can drop the X0 from the notation. Um, now, let's apply this. to our configuration space Fn still upstairs okay. so it's these n tuples of points in R2 and they're all distinct so let's pick some x0 because you still need to pick it even if you can if they're all isomorphic and so x0 here will be in r2 1 0 2 0 and 0 and let's look at what is a loop in Fn based at x0. So I will take a gamma t of elements. Well, I could parameterize my notations. Z1 of ten, Zn of t. So they're all distinct at any time. I want gamma of 0 to be this x0 and gamma 1 to be this x1. <sighs> what do you think that is? Do you can you imagine something? If my r2 is x, y like that, and my t goes like that, between 0 and 1. 
and I start at one zero, two zero, and zero, one zero, two zero, and zero. And I go, I follow maybe Z1. And maybe Z2. Do you recognize something? What is it? It is the geometry grades and this morning, but not all of them. Did you notice something? Where are my endpoints of the strand? Yes, so if you want to look at the projection of, so I'm describing a geometric grade. But um, the projection of this braid, what was my notation? I'm not sure I gave the notation. Or was it as gamma maybe? That the describe in sigma n is the identity. So if I start at I0, my strands go back to I0. And so these braids are called pure braids. And if I look at um, these loops in Fn up to isotopy, I land in the subgroup. So let me write this somewhere. No, not you. So what I'm saying is that if I take a loop gamma in Fn, I can identify this into a braid, geometrical braid. I'm claiming that if I look at this inside Bn, so up to isotopy then what I'm doing is that no, another step I'm looking at this in this phi1 of Fn x0 so up to homotopy but I all this is very hand wavy and here the image is PBN the pure bait group and this PBN is nothing but the kernel of this projection sigma n. What are we doing on time? So to finish with all that, it's already nice that we have captured a subgroup, but we want to have the break group as a fundamental group of a space. So what can I do to fix that? 
Remember that we had the pure break group because we decided to uh, start with one zero to zero and zero and our loops just come back to the same point. But what I had from the start, is it still there? Yes. Is that my configuration space were ordered um, points, so a configuration of points that was ordered. So if I started from the beginning with not an n tuple, but just a subset of n distinct points without the ordering, then I could look at this initial point without the ordering and mix everything at the end point. So what I'm saying is that if you look at the configuration space of unordered, oh, how do I say that? If I say something wrong, where are my notes? Where are my notes? I didn't say anything. Of ordered, unordered uh, sets of n distinct points. So CN. So I'm taking subsets. instead of parentheses. Uh, if you still want them distinct, because you don't want the string to collide into each other, then uh, by one of Cn, and then a new x0, which is now the collection, of the same points as before, one zero, two zero, and zero. Uh, then this is isomorphic now to the break group. So why did I bother to start with Fn, except to tell you a bit about pure break groups? Also because um, somehow it's easier to see Cn as, so on Fn, you can act with the symmetric group by permutating the entries of your vector d1, dn. And the quotient of Fn by this action is this Cn. And maybe this is the better way to endo the CN of a topology, which you need to define properly this fundamental group. So, yeah, maybe I will make a few remarks on that tomorrow and then speak a bit also about mapping cross group, but I will stop here for today. Do you have any questions? So there are less proofs now and more ideas for you to carry with you from this mini course. And otherwise we'll spend hours and hours justifying every step. Mm -hmm.